So recently I sat down to watch this interview that Rick Beato conducted with the guitarist from Animals as Leaders, Periphery, and Polyphia. Now while I don't really listen to those bands, I do have a very big admiration for their music and they are all really great guitar players so I decided to sit down and watch it. Despite Tosin Nabasi talking about how music school limits your creativity and I am a big product of music school. I had that fear of going to music school that if I, if I made the fretboard finite, then like it, my ideas would actually be limited. Although I don't necessarily disagree with him on that. But while I was watching that interview, there's a few points that really struck out to me that I kind of wanted to comment on and give a little bit of my thoughts on and share with all of you. Now, if you've been to this channel before, you know that I do a bunch of different music theory videos. I talk a lot about harmonic analysis, talk about polyrhythms and all this stuff. And from simply watching these videos, one might think that I am of the mind that you need to know music theory to create music or like music theory is really necessary to become a great musician and all that. But actually, I kind of disagree with that. I actually grew up on Foo Fighters, and Dave Grohl doesn't even know the notes on the guitar, and I think he made beautiful music. And so I want to start off by talking about one point that Misha Mansour and Rick Beato brought up. So in this video, Misha claims that he doesn't know what he's doing, and Rick Beato kind of refutes that, and I kind of wanted to add on to that, because I really agree with Rick Beato. Even if you don't know what you're doing, and, and you guys know what you're doing, but I'm I just don't saying, know what I'm doing. Okay, I, well, I, I, <laughs> I love it when people break down what, what I'm doing, because it's like, it, it makes it sound like, like, there was purpose there. Yeah. Or, I mean, but it's, it does, and it doesn't matter if you know what you're doing. Yeah. It's just all based it's instinct. On, on instinct yeah. and taste. There's sort of this notion that has been bred through the last few centuries of music education that you need to know music theory. And to use a term that Amy coined, music theory is actually just the harmonic style of 18th century Western European musicians. And so in music circles, we tend to think, oh, like this guy knows theory, this guy doesn't know theory. This girl knows her intervals, this girl doesn't know her scales. This person knows all the modes, this person doesn't even know the notes on the guitar. And somehow, especially in the online circles, that sort of became the measure of success as a musician or like a level of competency. And while it's really nice that there's all these resources available on the internet like YouTube where you can find videos for free in music theory, I also feel like to some degree, it sort of discourages some people like, oh, I need to learn music theory in order to do this. But even like I brought up in the beginning of the video, Tosin Obasi argues that going to music school will drain your creativity. And he's sort of talking about the regimented stepwise training that music school goes through. But the thing is, as human beings, we're designed to like do good things. And that's a very vague statement because good and bad don't necessarily have any meaning it's very subjective and personal but if you're a musician and you're creating music and you're creating original music naturally you won't want to sound bad unless you're intentionally trying to sound bad in which case you're actually doing something good because to me what's good is something that's made with intention so whenever we sit down to create something whether it's music art or any other piece of thing usually we're trying to make something good and usually we will filter out through the bad stuff until we find what's good and do more of the good stuff. Yes, it's like a flow chart. Does it sound good? Yes, okay, keep working on it. No, can you fix it? Yes, fix it. If you can't, move on to the next thing. Periphery album, but even that's a with... periphery album. Now, although this isn't like an academic thing and you're not like writing theses on why you chose certain things in your compositions and why you like this sound and this and that, and you might not be able to name the scale that you're playing, but your ear and your mind is registering that piece of information as like this is good piece of music this i want to use this more often and this is something i encountered in high school i even had a friend who like played like licks in a major scale without really knowing what the major scale was and was able to run up and down the scale but it's not because he like studied major scales it's because his ear drove him to that sound and he figured that out that that was like a good database of musical information to create from and really that's all music theory is and the formal names and the technical names and all these like like music theory music school jargon that i'm using is really that just jargon it's just one way of naming something the same way that if you look at how rhythm is taught in the western world versus like i don't know like how indian classical music is taught very different ways of naming the same thing but at the end of the day it has the same effect one example is going one e anna for 16th notes versus takidimi. There's no difference at all, it's just different syllables. And sometimes I prefer takidimi because it rolls off the tongue better than one yana. But anyway, there's an idea that, oh, I don't really know what I'm doing, but you actually do know what you're doing intuitively because your mind is telling you this sounds good, this sounds bad, your ear is guiding you, and you're sort of already creating a database, just you're not doing it in the same way that they did in textbooks, which is not inherently a bad thing. In fact, it might even be a better thing because you have a more emotional connection to the piece of information rather than just reading it from a textbook. Like how reading about a perfect authentic cadence is just like, oh, cool, this is perfect. Great but actually experiencing the seven to one relationship that sounds great and you feel the emotional impact another point that was brought up was about patterns and how our ears gravitate to certain things what's interesting is you could probably break down and deconstruct my tendencies and where my ear tends to lead me 
Like, I'll, I'll notice patterns in the things that you, your ear likes to reach for, and I, I consider them to be, like, distinctly you. Mm -hmm. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. And one thing that I wanted to add is that humans really kind of revolve around patterns and operate within these patterns. And then we sort of have to talk about cliches. And in the music or art worlds, we hear cliches, and a lot of times there's, like, this really negative connotation, but cliches aren't necessarily a bad thing. It, one thing that could be a cliche can also be interpreted as your, like, signature lick, or, oh, that's this sound, which people really love. And to me, I think this has to do with repetition. There's a lot of talk about how certain music is repetitive like oh jazz is just ding 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 or like how like techno is really repetitive i mean it is a loop but but as adam neely pointed out in, in a video repetition legitimizes and in my opinion whether the repetition is good or bad is determined by whether or not you like the content an example that i can think of is that at one point in my life i was like really into lo mein and i went to like a bunch of different chinese places and ate lo mein every day that week and just like consumed that because i was really into that if I didn't like that, like let's say I was eating like a salad, sorry I don't eat salads, then I would really hate eating salads every day. But because I liked the thing, I wanted to consume it more. The same happens with albums, like for example Phoebe Bridger's Punisher album. I listened to that album non-stop for like a few months and because I really loved it. But if you put it on a song I didn't really like and you put it on repeat, I would be going crazy at the end of it. And then there's also the aspect of playlists, which is seemingly how the majority of people listen to music. People listen to playlists for a specific mood or specific vibe. And there's a bunch of different songs, but they're all around sort of the same style or the same mood. So like these cliches kind of contribute to that. It contributes to your style. If you're using the same devices, you're actually sort of making a playlist and you're like creating an album with a lot of similar stuff. You're actually sort of creating a playlist that creates a specific mood and a specific vibe. And this is sort of drastically different for, for example, like Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, where it's supposed to be like a journey and everything's supposed to be really different. It's a really different approach, but it's seemingly equally valid because people are listening to playlists and they like to listen to the same thing over and over. And I think at the end of the day, your cliches sort of become your sound and it's what makes you unique. And like, we should kind of learn to lean into that. And anyway, I kind of want to just give some thoughts on this. I made a video a while ago about how music theory matters, but also why it doesn't matter. So if you enjoyed this or you wanted more information or more thoughts, check that video out. But anyway, thank you so much for sticking to all the way to the end. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and I hope to see you in the next video. Take care.